uh, Asia Pacific WSDC. Um, my name's Ian, I'll be your chair for uh, this round. Um, the reminder that this debate is a silent round, so that means at the end of the debate, uh, I won't be giving an oral adjudication and uh, you're able to get feedback until after the draw is released. Um, so as soon as the debate's done, uh, you can just head back into the main room. Uh, also a reminder that uh, speeches are eight minutes long, replies are four minutes, and POIs are permitted between one minute and seven minutes. I'll be giving a uh, I'll be giving a bell at one minute seven one minute and seven minutes, and I'll be giving two bells at eight minutes. So the bell will sound like this. Is that loud enough for people to hear? Cool. Yeah, so just give a shout if it doesn't. Um, okay, then. Uh, yeah, so I, it looks like we're just um, sorting out the, uh, the status in terms of the recording for this debate. Um, I guess once that's sorted, we'll uh, begin. Okay, cool. So it looks like one speaker's indicated that I wouldn't uh, would like not to be recorded. Um, so is everything ready on your end, uh, Wayon, to um, get the uh, yeah get the debate started and rolling? Okay, sweet. That's great. Okay, then in that case, uh, I'll welcome up the first speaker of the, okay, sweet, yeah. In that case, I'll welcome the first speaker of the proposition team to open the team's case. Am I clearly audible? Yep, can you, you loud and clear. All right, uh, before I start my speech, I would prefer my POIs verbally, so please say it out loud if you have a POI. Right. problem in the status quo is that while feminism and the West has generally progressed, it still remains that people still feel like they have to be in a relationship to be successful. They cannot have like, like a woman so not have much individual liberty when it comes to this matter. I'm going to explain that later. In my speech, a few things done. Like first, I'm just going to set up and tell you what we support and don't support. It's not to give you two substantives. First substantive on how we promote individual liberty for women. And second of all, how we stop forcing people into relationships and I'll tell you the impact of that then. Firstly, on setup, I think the first thing to know is it's very important to say that it's like in the West, i.e., like the main principles of feminism has like gotten uh has gotten addressed already. Things like equality, things like uh having like uh, other things like relating to like equality and just general rights for women. I think this then means that like any rights that we have like for the uh any like goals for the feminism movement in general, or just regarding like taking down part patriarchal structures and taking down things like uh, toxic masculinity. How are we going to sort of like enforce this and sort of spread this message? I think this is generally just like uh, how we're going to spread like messages, i.e. through media or through other things to like social networks. It's a primary message. That's the same, right? While we're going to be spreading this message quite heavily, we're not going to say that like relationships are bad and that you shouldn't actually be in relationships. The message that we're going to spread is not rule, right? The most important thing is yourself. And the most important thing is focusing on yourself before everyone else. It's completely fine and it's very desired if you don't want to be in a relationship at all then a few pieces of characterization. First thing then, right, a lot of people in society just generally value relationships uh, in the status quo. First thing then, I think it's because of patriarchal structures in the past, i.e. the fact that, you know, you have to be like in a marriage in order to actually like be successful, right? I think previously what you needed was a marriage because like uh, generally women were considered to be housewives and women were generally just like less uh, advantaged, right? I think these patriarchal structures still exist in the status quo because even the feminism movement spread the message that you need to be fulfilled to be in one of these relationships. Even if these re uh, relationships are generally positive, I think that it still means that like these relationships are seen as a desired thing. I think the 
it goes on to the point where people still feel like they need to be in a relationship to be successful and to be happy. I think a while the feminism movement has done a good job in saying that you actually have to be happy and have to be fulfilled in these relationships. People still feel like it's a necessity and that in order to be successful and in order to be considered living a desired a desirable life, you have to be in a relationship. No offense. And that's the romanticization of relationships in the status quo. That is the same, right? In the status quo, it's often like the narrative of like uh, meeting the prince charming and then instantly falling in love and then everything is going to be great. Like this narrative is on constantly like pushed in the status quo, right? People often say like, as soon as you meet your soulmate, everything is going to be fine and you're no longer going to have any problems in life, right? And if it's not true, we think that like, uh, we think that, like being single is also has like a lot of advantages and people would, like be desire to be single, right? But we don't think this narrative is pushed enough in the case that people often say that you have to be in a relationship in order to be like the best person. And every sort of like goal in like life it also like somehow involves like being in a relationship. It's the idea of sort of like toxic masculinity in which like uh, without a girlfriend or without a romantic partner, like a male is somehow like considered like not that worthy or not that great of a life. And I expanded this later then. Here's two pieces of characterization. I'm going to give you first of all the tangible harm of this sort of like idealization of these uh, relationships. I think first thing and like most foremost, right? People just have to rush into relationships. No matter if it's whether you're just not ready in general, I like your mental state is like not really fit to be in a relationship. Secondly, right, if you just don't feel like you want to be in a relationship at all, you know, these people just have to rush into relationships simply because society tells them it's good and that you should do that as well. Well, right, you, know, you need a partner to be successful. I guess when goes to the breakup, they still think that society tells them that they need a partner to be successful and that they're not really worthy of being like uh, uh being successful and being happy while they're single. I think that right, I'm trying to promote individual liberty for women. First of all, right, I'm that you can like make decisions uh to be single just because you want to be single. I think it's not possible in the status quo, right? Like, the fact that the opposition will provide simply because uh, relationships are idealized. And when people actively want to become relation, uh, uh, like go into relationships, I think the only reason, like, society has a conception that if you're single, it's not because of choice, right? If you're single, it's because you can't get a boyfriend. Or if you're single, it's because you just got out of a breakup and, like, you're not in a relationship right now. It's never the case that someone's single because, like, they want to be single. At least that's what society thinks. On our side, where we have people who can actually make decisions about whether they want to be single or not, and that narrative is pushed by society. I mean, society actively says, like, look, right, you can have your own liberty, you can be single if you want, it's very good that you can find, like, love in yourself, and you can actually be your own partner. And this message is generally a net positive, right? Because there's so many women who are in relationships and, like, don't want to be in relationships. We think, on an individual scale, this is going to be good. My second speaker will expand on this then. Like we, think we can push the narrative now that you can seek happiness inside yourself, right? I think we push the narrative that you don't need a partner to be happy and all you need is yourself. I think it's particularly prevalent and very crucial to know because society has long pushed the narrative that you need a romantic partner in order to be happy. I think that this happens, I mean, people they push the narrative that you can actually be happy with yourself and not with anyone else, right? Then that it causes like a better fulfilling relationships and you start forcing people into relationships as they're going to expand on my second thing. Oh, then, right? It's further the goals of feminism and the goals of feminism is better. I think it's very important to know here that social movement progression is quite important, right? I think in the West, uh, social movement and the feminism movement has generally achieved its primary goals, right? I.e. in society, we think that women generally have equal rights, right? They're able to do the same things that men do. They're able to like have the same rights and like not really be discriminated against, uh, at least in the law. But we need to fix them, right? like undermine these patriarchal structures and probably both these patriarchal structures like not really uh worth listening to and that you're able to sort of like live your life by yourself and be happy i think with this step we're more better able to further this feminism movement and make sure that the goals are heard right because we are believe all people that can be by themselves and be happy and actively undermine the patriarchal structure of, like the covenant of marriage and the relationship we're much better to improve this on our side before everyone for my second substantive will take a pui Um, do you think in your world, if you're constantly told that you should feel happy with yourself and being single, that it's easy for people to then opt into the life of wanting a relationship? I think it's hard 
website, right? We talk about that they can be very happy while they're single. We're not like we already clarified in our setup that we're not explicitly saying like you can't be in a relationship or being in a relationship is explicitly bad. Instead, we're actually pushing the narrative that you can be very happy by yourself and you're able to live a fulfilled life by yourself without anyone else, right? Because as long as you want to be in a relationship and you're ready, we're not like, actively against the narrative, but we're heavily pushing the narrative that you can be like very happy with yourself. Also, the second perspective done, right? Stop pushing people into relationships. Three types of people that we actively benefit under here, right? First, people who are generally unprepared, i.e., you know, like uh, their mental health isn't the best and they just don't want to be in a relationship at the moment or temporarily. Right? In this case, right? But if society doesn't tell them that they need to be in a relationship, they're just going to opt out of the relationship narrative and they're going to say, look, right? I don't want to be in a relationship. I'm just not going to be it until I feel more ready, right? I think when the relationship isn't seen as an ultimate goal, rather it's seen as something that can make you happy, rather when we tell them that they can be happy by themselves as well, we think that these unprepared people are more likely to stay single and be fulfilled by themselves. The second group of people, right, is people who just generally don't want to be in a relationship, right? And this is like includes people who just generally want to focus on other things other than being in a relationship, i.e. their career, i.e. Uh, like their other things, Etc. Right. I mean, these, in this case, we're more likely to benefit these people as well, right? Because we don't tell them that they need to be in a relationship. I.e., we tell them they can focus on other things instead of like a relationship in general. They're more likely to stop being forced, and they're going to be productive and happy as well. But all the above, I'm so proud to propose. Well, I thank the speaker for the speech. Um, just letting you know that I've asked the uh, other speakers if they're not speaking to turn their cameras off, as I'm uh, had a bit of an issue with the um, some of the audio being choppy. In their last speech. Um, all right, I uh, think the speaker for the speech. I'll now invite up the first speaker of the opposition team to open the team's case. Hi, my honorable. Yep, can hear you. All right, thanks. Panel, it is not a contradiction to be happy with yourself and be self-fulfilled while also loving someone and being in a loving relationship. What is a contradiction, however, is them telling us you want to have an extremely successful narrative that is able to counteract what they characterize as an extremely strong one that told women that they had to be in relationships to be happy, while simultaneously saying that we would support women being in relationships if that's the choice that they wanted. Side government cannot have the best of both worlds. They have to pick a stance and have to have a solid, like an, actually a solid case, right? Okay. Just before I get into my um, main rebuttals, I'm just going to clarify a few things. Number one, what is exactly is our counterfactual? We support choice feminism, right? We support giving information and awareness to women in order to counteract the narratives that they say are um, are prevalent, but we do not jump to the opposite extreme of demonizing relationships. For side of government, they either want to choose between idealization and demonization of relationships at as a whole, I think we choose a more reasonable middle ground by saying whatever makes you happy is what is valuable and what is meaningful to you. It's fine to be a housewife and it's fine to be an incredibly independent woman. Um, to be married, is, is, if it's fulfilling for you, go for that. We would note that to heavily promote and in order for them to have a case that actually works, um, because like you have to use, sort of use a blanket narrative, right? You can't target specific cases because you as a, as a leader of the feminist movement will never know which of your followers is actually the one that needs this sort of encouragement right now versus someone who's like, um, versus someone who's already in a happy relationship, you can't target women like that. So it has to be a blanket policy. And if they want it to be effective, it has to, and, they, and it has to be effective for them to have a functioning case. Um, so in the, in the scenarios that occur, you will either have them heavily promoting it and it being effective, or you would alienate individuals who choose to be in relationships from feminism. And I think that these people will exist on both sides. It's just that they choose to alienate them um, inside government. We'll talk a bit more about that later in substantives. All right, into rebuttals. So I think that government, like PM was very repetitive um, in talking about, oh, women, liberty for women, um, and kind of went over the same thing by saying, oh, we, we won't tell people that relationships are bad, yet we don't want it to be a desired thing so that 
that you can finally choose to love yourself? We have a few responses to this. So number one, like the reasons why this won't necessarily be the case that women don't feel that they are being pressured into relationships. So one, our mechanism as a feminist movement, given a limited allocation of resources, we would stop telling women to like, um, we wouldn't simply just tell women like a blanket policy of just don't be in a relationship. Rather, we would dedicate resources to educating them and making sure that they know what to like when to make the choice that is right for them. Two, we have a rise in career focused aspirational feminism that chooses to prioritize like that chooses to prioritize career growth and success within the field of work. Thirdly, we say that often people push a lot of caution when you're doing making big decisions like getting engaged, getting into a serious relationship, moving in together, getting married. All of these sorts of things mean that this is a decision that women will consider carefully. This is not something that they simply jump into. I think that they ignore the status quo when we note that Western societies are becoming more progressive, that there isn't such a large pressure in order to jump into relationships. We don't agree that single people are demonized within status quo. I think the majority of women right now are single, right? They're, they're not, and they're not being demonized for it because they're trying to actively search for the relationship that will make them happy. We should not not simply tell them that it is illegitimate for them to want to seek love. We think that we support choice under our side of the house. Um, all right, two arguments. Number one, why the purpose of feminism is to empower women of all walks of life. And secondly, how they detriment the feminist movement and policy progress. I, I mean, they tried to make a one-liner about making sure women are heard. We're not sure how that mechanizes or where the analysis is. We'll do a bit better job of proving that. All right, first argument three levels of analysis. Number one, why it's okay to want to be married and okay to want to be in a relationship. We say that you can love yourself while still loving your significant other. We think it's it's fine for you to have that sort of intrinsic fulfillment from being a relationship and having a family. And even this, right, is not necessarily a bad thing. It falls under a spectrum. So you can be a woman in a relationship while still being the breadwinner. We have things like stay-at-home dads. We have things like gay relationships that don't align with the sorts of stereotypes that they want to present to us in our increasingly postmodern world that allows for women to have a lot of choices. And even if women choose to stay at home and be a housewife and are very hyper feminine, we say this is entirely valid in and of itself because this is a choice that women want to make. The point of all this is that love is meaningful, it is a good part of the human experience, and you should not deny women from it. Second level of analysis, why this aligns with the feminist movement. Because the feminist movement is all about equality and choice. It is, it is paternalistic to, dictate what, to dictate what kind of life is good for an individual. Because it, these women have bodily autonomy, have the free will that we're trying to protect as feminists. They know what is the best for themselves because they know their experiences, they know what they like, they have information that we're able to give them, and they're the ones that will deal with the consequences of getting into a relationship or not. So I think that this is an extremely painstaking thought process that we should respect them and allow them to make. The feminist movement is all about diversity and it's all about intersectionality. So it's about the legitimation of identities and creating a safe space when there is no other. By saying that it's okay for you to want to be in a relationship, even though um, even though the rest of society tells you not to. Finally, and thirdly, on the impacts of this. So firstly, like I said previously within my set up, this is likely to alienate, this policy that government is pushing is likely to alienate women by telling them that their marriage isn't good for them, telling them that, oh, you're you're a fake feminist if you choose to marry a man, Why, um, and being extremely man-hating in that manner, as we're seeing with a lot of, um, like, of like third wave feminism on social media. And for these women, the most important and vulnerable women, because we recognize there is a small subset of society that maybe isn't happy in their relationships, even under our worst case scenario, we believe that it's still better because we have some form of support structure, whereas they actively lose it when they choose to alienate this section of society. They no longer have anyone to open up to under their side of the house. Otherwise, if you do not alienate them, you coerce them into making a choice, including young, impressionable girls who may have found happiness in a relationship or had more experiences in their lives, but now don't because of the feminist movement. We think choice feminism is important. Second argumentation then, why this detriments the feminist movement, feminist movement and policy progress. Two levels of analysis. Number one, in how this is portrays the feminist movement as being highly misandrist and man-hating and straying from their grounding principles of equality towards pursuing like um, taglines like independence and girl power at the expense at the expense of actually collaborating with men and, and like um, yeah so um, this has a few consequences. Firstly, the fractionalization of the movement, as, as we told you earlier, this uh, this creates a lot of alienation. But secondly, we think that it's it because you portray the feminist movement as man-hating, as being anti-tradition and ag against the institution of the family, we, we recognize that it's much harder to make legislative decisions and to cooperate with men in everyday life when you further demonize the movement in this manner. But finally, about how this shifts burdens. And we think this is highly important because it puts the onus on a woman to not to be alone and to not be 
happy. Instead, um, and instead ignoring the structures that exist, the patriarchal structures that exist with society, we could choose to fix things like toxic masculinity, fix things like maternity leave, which is what holds back women, married women from pursuing career changes, for example. Instead of fixing these things, we are telling women that you should be alone and you should not pursue a relationship, even if that gives you fulfillment. I think that firstly, this makes it worse for people in relationships because there's no long-term change and no long-term change and no breakdown of these patriarchal structures. People will simply be told, oh, you're not happy in your relationship. Maybe your husband is, is not being very nice to you. Why don't you self-partner instead? That should never be the go-to option it should be about fixing these structures but also any of your fight for equality now has to be only focused on promoting independence or being in line with that so for example if you want welfare and maternity benefits for women people will now say i thought you were an independent woman i thought you could exist without the structures in society i thought you didn't need the help of a man it looks contradictory then and you therefore jeopardize more and more women with this policy as time progresses Chair, if you support choice, if you think that feminism is fundamentally about protecting and validating the identities of women from all walks of life, side with opposition. All right, thank you for speaking for a speech. Um, so uh, I'll invite up the second speaker of the uh, affirming team to come up and speak now. Um, while they're speaking, can both teams, um, can someone from both teams just start typing into the chat the names and speaker positions um, of the people who are speaking so I can note that down for the ballot at the end of the debate, please. Thanks. Uh, second speaker, um, you can start when you're ready. Okay. Um, can everyone hear me? Yep. I well, thank the speaker for speech. I'll now invite up the second speaker of the getting team to continue the team's case. Uh, hi, can everyone hear me? Yep. Chair, this debate is not about women being happy in a relationship versus women being happy when they are single, right? Opposition is the side that argues for choice feminism whether women want to be happy when they're single or dating, right? Government side is the one that pushes women to self-partnership and will prove to you about how heavily promoting self-partnership will eventually push women into the self-partnership idea and not uh, and therefore being unhappy in a lot and not getting fulfillment in life, right? What will I do? Firstly, I'll rebut, like uh, have a number of rebuttals for the case provided by government. And then I'll go on to the substantives in this main debate, right? So the first thing we heard from government is about how um, feminism spreads messages that you only get fulfillment in, re in relationships. I think this is false. Feminism, especially in current status quo, is about giving women a choice. Currently, feminism doesn't advocate for relationships nor self-partnerships, uh, self right? Feminism advocates for choice and we don't particularly promote either one of them. That's what society advocates. Society advocates um, that you have to be in a relationship and society advocates that uh, in, if you're in a relationship, relationship, it means you're happy. The second thing we heard is this idea that when the when feminism pushes this narrative, it's not directly forcing women into self-partnership. Government has to understand this. Heavily promoting, uh, heavily promoting self-partnership means feminism therefore or indirectly becomes about largely about self-partnership. The idea that you are uh, self-partnership also means that you are representing feminism, right? Women will feel that being feminist is also being, uh, is also like not having a relationship and not having a romantic partner, right? This is what women will therefore feel and therefore they'll become alienated at the point in which they actually do want to participate in a relationship. We already proved that to you, but I'll strengthen an argument later in how you fractionalize the feminist movement. 
The second thing we heard was that women are constantly being pressured to be in a relationship and will face like all sorts of mental trauma if they are not, right? This is not true. Understand that this debate is set in modern Western states, the point in which the, uh, like individuals are liberal and more inclusive, right? This means that women are like also allowed and they are, there are many women in modern Western states that are able to get careers and further their careers rather than having family and having children. But even if there is this uh, sort of immense pressure on women to have relationships, oftentimes this occurs in your world as well, right? Women aren't questioned and pressured the point in which they aren't in a relationship, but they will always be pressured and like even more questioned and suffer even more mental trauma, the point in which they actively choose to be single. Society will always pressure women into being in a relationship and the point in which uh, these women choose to be like in a self-partnership, oftentimes it means that uh, society will mount even more pressure on these individuals because it goes directly against what society advocates for, right? The third thing we heard was that there are less abusive relationships in the world of government where more people are in a relationship, uh, they don't opt for a relationship. Understand that abusive relationships will happen in both worlds. And the main reason for this is because men will, these men will be abusive and be sexist in both worlds. For example, if, me, if, me, if these men work with women, they will oftentimes abuse these women in the workplace. There will always be this form of abuse and uh, sexual abuse or discrimination that government cannot run away from, right? Understanding that what are the arguments that we bring to you in this debate? But uh, before that, is there any POIs? Uh, no. Okay, so the first argument we told you about is how feminism is supposed to be in an inclusive and empowering movement. So the first level we told you is the narrative of self-partnership. Self-partnership becomes the image of the feminism movement, the point in which you heavily promote it. Understand that this link means that the point in which you promote self-partnership, it also means that women feel obligated to, be, to not have a rom romantic partner or not opt into a relationship despite of what they want and despite of what will actually give them fulfillment. This is the thing that government needs to respond to. The point in which women become normalized and feel that having like not opting into a relationship is the idea of feminism. It becomes the benchmark to being a feminist at the point in which you heavily promote self-partnership. The second level therefore to this is oftentimes for individuals, for women who actually do want to opt into a relationship, you A, either coerce them into like not having a relationship and being happy by themselves, even though that's not what they actually want. But B, even if these women choose to still have a relationship, oftentimes you strip support structures away from these women if they are in abusive relationships or if they are in a relationship where they're not happy because feminism tells you that you're, you're supposed to be happy alone and these women oftentimes have no uh, support structure, right? The third level to this, what then is the impact? We'll tell you it leads to fractionalization of the feminism movement, right? Firstly, we told you you actively alienate women who actually want a relationship because they are seen as unfeminist, because they go against what the feminist, what the feminist movement says is actually appropriate and what the feminist movement says will give you happiness, right? We tell you for all those reasons, you fractionalize the feminist movement, the point in which you heavily promote self-partnership. But the second argument we told you about, how about how the image of feminist movement is largely corrupted, the point at which you appear anti-men, and note that this argument was largely unresponded to, right? So what was the first thing that we told you? The first thing that we told you is already in current status quo. There are narratives about a feminist movement being anti-men, about how uh, like women are more important than men. Oftentimes, this is because of like... Uh, sexist men and individuals who feel that feminist movement is being anti-men. But the point in which you like heavily promote self-partnership is also the point in which you the feminist movement says they actively reject the help of men and actively reject the allyship of men. What then does this do? Firstly, it increases backlash towards the feminist movement, oftentimes Oftentimes, because it means like you are able, like the anti-man stereotypes to the feminist movement is propagated further. But second thing, you lose you lose large amounts of support and allyship. And the reason as to why this is true is because oftentimes when you like actively reject, in your scene as actively rejecting the help of men, oftentimes it means you are rejecting the help, you are seen as rejecting the help of men in parliament or men in political power. And this means you lose a lot more allyship and a lot more political power, the point in which you want to like 
bring up more equal policies such as equaling the gender wage gap. For all those reasons, the point in which you promote self-partnership is also when the image of the feminist movement is corrupted by being seen as anti-men and therefore you lose allyship, the point in which you, active, you are seen as actively rejecting the health of men, right? And the third thing we told you is about how you shift the burden of men being less sexist to women, right? The first thing we told you is the problem in society today is because men are sexist and currently the feminism movement places burden on men to change. But the point in which you promote self-partnership means you shift the burden of uh, men from, from men to women, right? This means that women have to give up their self-fulfillment the point in which even if they want to be in a relationship, if they are in an unhappy relationship, it means they have to take the burden of not opting into a relationship rather than helping those men or like placing the burden on those men to change, right? For all those reasons, I'm now in powder to... Well, thank you speaking for the speech. I'll now invite up the third speaker of the affirming team to conclude the substantive portion of the team's case. Okay. Opposition says that they're going to give women a choice, right? But we think that the choice on opposition side is coerced and pressured by societal norms of being in a relationship, right? They try, wait, we think that like a huge part of this debate has been about the burdens, right? And first of all, I'm going to be clarifying those, right? And secondly, I'm also going to be talking about which side actually helps women better, right? But firstly, about the burdens, right? They tell us that because the motion says that it's heavily promote, right? Then we this means that we have to promote like simply we have to promote an extreme uh the extreme that they're saying right we don't think that this is true at all we have made it very clear from first speaker right that the status quo right now is that being in a relationship is the norm, right? We're telling you that the status quo is romanticizing being a relationship. It is pressuring these women to be in a relationship, right? What we are doing on our side is simply neutralizing these norms, right? By heavily, we think that by heavily promoting it, right? It is the only way you're able to get these women to feel empowered, to get these women not to be pressured into being into a really relationship, right? We think we tell you that, but we tell that like, our side mitigates this because we think that the current, because we think that to heavily promote it is the only way to break out of this, right? We, we think that what Ob needs to prove is why promoting self-partnership is intrinsically is harmful, right? And I'm also going to be rebutting to other points that they've mentioned, right? What they've told us is that they've, uh, and second speaker, they've given us a list of harms of all these things that women are facing, right? And they tell that, oh, it'll happen anyway. So what's the point, right? They tell, we tell you that. We tell you they, tell, they try and tell you that society, no thank you, society will always push against women being single, so they'll just face even more discrimination, right? Which is why we shouldn't heavily promote this concept. We think that this logic is extremely flawed, right? If we think that the very, if this is the very reason why we need to heavily promote these women being, uh, uh, these women being single, right? These women having self-partnership, right? It's because they currently face discrimination, right? We tell you that the counterfactual on the opposition side, this absolutely makes no sense, right? And does not actually acknowledge the pressures of the real world and what sexism actually looks like in today's world. We think that they've actually given no mechanism either to show how they're going to solve the problems that they themselves mentioned, right? They simply tell you that we're going to give women choice, but they never actually show you how they're going to progress the movement, how they're going to improve women's lives, right? All they've given you is one-liners, right? We don't think that their counterfactual is enough against ours, right? We, think, we tell you that even if we take them at their best and if we take them on their grounds, we tell you that it's fine to just encourage women, right? Because we think that for centuries, women have been economically, economically and emotionally oppressed by like marriage and by relationships and by things like that, right? We tell you that it's absolutely reasonable to progress the movement in a way that is promoting women to be self-sufficient, right? To be independent, right? We tell you that all of our benefits, right? Completely outweigh that the harms that they say there are, right? They try and tell you that, um, they try and tell you, and we tell you that we tell you that all their arguments hinge on the assertion that our side hates men and are anti-men, right? We don't think that this is true at all, right? We tell you that on our side, it's simply going to be perceived as women simply fighting for basic equality, right? Because right now, they are pressured into being into relationships, right? Right now, we tell you, we tell you that what it's going to be perceived as, we don't think that they're going to be, they're going to lose support, and we don't think that that's going to happen, right? We think that it's only going to be perceived as women simply fighting for equality, right? On our side, we're able to expand relationship narratives, right, and help those who are currently disenfranchised, right, to help those who are currently just like not validated by their choices, by their beliefs, right? We don't think that the opposition is able to do that at all, right, because their counterfactual just does not include them, because we tell you the current status quo is just not balanced. 
so they're unable to do this, right? Point. We tell you that, uh, sure. Side of opposition does not defend the status quo where we propagate and prioritize relationships. We literally told you from two speakers that we want a world in which women just opt into whatever feels makes them feel happy. Okay, but we, I've told we our our team has repeatedly told you that when they're making this choice in the status quo, it's already pressured by the societal norms to be in a relationship, and our side is going to mitigate that. Why your side simply just lets this happen and tell and your side promotes like this false choice, right? We don't think that this is the case. Okay, so on which side? actually helps women, right? We tell you that when our side is able to mitigate these harms, when our side is able to empower women, right? We think that, right? So, so what, what opposition tries and tell you is that because we're, uh, this debate is set in the modern Western world, that women aren't demonized at all, that this doesn't happen. They try and uh, they try and tell you this, right? Uh, panel, please do not uh, buy this, right? We tell you that even in a world and even in a modern Western world, women face all these pressures, right? We can tell you, we see this, like we see this on an individual level, right? There is a, a huge social pressure. We think that it's enforced from a young age, right? We think that the capacity for internalizing negative beliefs about female roles is, is completely perpetrated by things like the media, right? Things like TV shows, right? That show high school girls unpopular if they don't have boyfriends, right? We tell you that they absolutely give you no detail and no nuance as to, as to why women in today's world don't actually face these problems, right? They simply give you one-liners about, well, in today's world, there's already equality, right? We don't think that this is the case at all, right? We think that what you need, what needs to be done is you need to change the mindset of society, right? We tell you like this, we tell you that the current status quo is why so many women stay in abusive relationships, like right? why there is so much domestic violence, right? We tell you a lot of the times women stay in these abusive relationships because they feel alone in the world if they don't have anyone else, right? They stay in the relationships because they think they're able to change their man, change the mindset of their partner, and, and like and feel better right? because they're not secure enough in their independence right we tell you that they feel that as long as they're able to keep trying to keep their relationship working right because of the romanticization of the relationship of, of a relationship in today's status quo right and that as long as they put in all their effort to keep the relationship going because staying in a re abusive a relationship right is so much better than god forbid being single we tell you that this is the reality in today's uh, today's status quo and that the opposition just provides you no way of actually mitigating these harms. Or we tell you that the progression, we tell you that like what we do, right? It stop forcing people into relationships when they're not mentally ready or when they're not satisfied with, them, with themselves yet, right? We tell you that on our side, the feminist movement will start to inc will, will begin to incorporate these other narratives, right? We're not completely, we're not like letting go of all the previous narratives that the feminist movement has supported from in history. We're, we're telling you that simply in this point of time with the progression of the feminist movement, we are incorporating these other narratives. We're incorporating the concept of self-partnership. We think that is so important with all the reasons I've given you above, right? We also think that like, we, so like, uh, what have I told you today, right? I've told you that the opposition's counterfactual does not do anything in today's unbalanced world, right? I've told you the importance of self-partnership in today's context. And we also, and um, I've also told you how none of, uh, how all of the opposition's arguments hinge on the straw man of our case, right? Which is why I'm so proud to uh, propose today. Thank you. Well, I thank the speaker for his speech. I'll invite up the third speaker of the gaining team to conclude the substantive portion of the team's case. Um, hi, can you hear me? Yep, can okay, hear you. Great. Starting in three, two, one. I'll make my speech really simple because the side of proposition does not want to be reasonable and engage with the nuances we brought to you from the multiple speeches before me. We've told you simply that our counterfactual was never something complicated in the first place. We told you all it is was giving women the ability to choose. Why is this something that can't exist simply on their side? Because currently in the world, you're told to be in a relationship which is not what we said we would defend. Why is it any different on the side of proposition when you tell and encourage individuals and promote and tell them that you should then be alone or be single in order to be happy. We think this is the very same scenario, but it's reversed. What we then said we defended was individuals not telling a woman what makes them happy, what makes me feel fulfilled, and what makes me satisfied in life. We told you that simply we would challenge the narrative that entrenches people that want to be in a relationship, but we then wouldn't promote any other narrative insofar 
uh, at all. We would rather have a now where no narratives exist and women then choose for themselves what they want to pursue. And notice, and I'll explain to you concretely, finally, why the ability for you to be heavily promoting of this narrative or of this concept cannot mean that, oh, I'm going to be okay with you being in a relationship. Because notice, all of their benefits hinge on individuals opting out of being in a relationship. The idea of individuals being empowered lies in the assumption that people will then opt out of wanting to be being in a relationship. The ability to pursue a career instead of having to be tied down to a family also assumes that you're going to opt out of a relationship and be single in the first place. And the need and the ability to be happy then also lies in the assumption that you will opt out of being in a relationship in order to feel self-fulfilled in the first place. Noticing that all of their benefits are contingent on you being a single individual and opting into that promotion, they can't just tell you, oh, we're going to tell them that this is an option. Because when they want to stigmatize and tell us that our side or the status quo is one that is heavily stereotyped to tell women that you, in order to feel happy, to have any sort of success or feel levels of fulfillment, you need a relationship. You can't merely neutralize it because these are, new, these are narratives that have been entrenched for centuries within culture. You have to then demonize in order to shift individuals into opting into your system. So if they want to defend the soft case that they've been bringing up from three speakers, you can't take any of the benefits in the first place. You can't take any of the benefits they wanted to tell you because this is basically the status quo. We think currently in Western feminism, there's a prioritization of women in the workforce, climbing the social ladder, not being tied down to a family already. Why is this any different if you're just telling individuals information or they already know? What you need to be doing is legitimizing the choice to choose. On their side, they make you, they force you in or they force you and curse you into a life in which you don't do so. Why is this so? Because we told you to counteract the apparent mass amounts of narratives saying that you need a relationship to be good. You then have to discourage it or make it unpreferable. If not, prop loses all of their benefits because of the amount of women who actually opt out of that system and feel empowered is marginal at best. But secondly, what they then do is shift the oppression on a scale. So currently now, individuals that want to be single are oppressed or are delegitimized. On their side, individuals that want relationships that feel fulfilled by having a partner also feel the very same thing because of micro interactions that happen to you, which coerces you into doing so. So when you're in a relationship, what do people around you tell you? Why aren't you fulfilled with yourself? Why don't you love yourself enough? Why do you need someone else to fill the gap that's in your heart, for example? You make it seem like this is an individual that's incapable of loving themselves and therefore have to then opt into a single life in order to have any sort of self-respect or self-value. Or secondly, because of when you grow up young, where this is a narrative that's highly perpetuated and popular, before even engaging in a relationship, you tell yourself that it's unnecessary to need a man in my life, and therefore I'll just pursue other things before you even explore whether being in a relationship makes you happy or not. So individuals are indirectly coerced into not opting into these systems in the very first place. We change all of this on opposition side, very simply by just not having a narrative at all, by giving women the ability to choose what makes them happy, for themselves. This is uniquely why the side of government or the side of proposition completely falls. Because number one, they didn't engage with this context. And number two, they constantly try to straw man and tell you why this is not the case. And lastly, I just told you why the constant and convenient defense from the side of proposition telling you they can have both merely doesn't exist and you shift the oppression. What we do then is make challenge patriarchal societies and structures as a whole. So currently now in their world, when you want to pursue a relationship or uh, when you want to work and become the CEO of the next company. It is up to you as the woman to not be in a relationship. It is up to you if you don't want to be a housewife to not be in a relationship. We think this is just running away from these structures that are still perpetuated within society because what we then need to change and challenge is that I can be in a relationship and as a woman can also be the sole breadwinner while my husband stays at home. I can also be the individual that's the CEO while my husband stays at home. These are narratives and like stereotypes that you run away from and you never directly challenge because the simple solution is to not be in a relationship in the first place. And lastly, and most damaging and just absurd to hear from this sort of proposition was to assume that being in a relationship makes or like anyone assumes that because society tells you that a relationship is good, which is not what we defend, that people are okay with abusive relationships. In what world are they living? Where even in the most conservative societies where people tell you this, no one ever says it's okay for your husband to constantly beat you, to make you feel like you're less of a human being in the first place. This is not something that they can just merely push and be like, oh, individuals are less likely going to be domestically abused, for example. But even in that best case, and assuming you believe that is true, we can never blame the woman for being a victim of abusive relationships. Why is the burden on a woman to not be in a relationship, to avoid being abused in the first place? Why is it not the perpetrator's fault? Why is it not the abusive individual's fault for 
acting on those tendencies or being abusive in the very first place. And these are people that you never change. So they are going to be people in the workforce that are disabusive, just absent of a partner. They're going to be the rapists. They're going to be the people that ask for sexual favors in order to give promotions to women in the very first place. We think the case from the side of opposition was very simple then. And we told you, we've concretely told you why we win on all fronts. Because as a woman in the world of opposition, there is no one telling you what makes me happy, what should make you happy, what should make you feel fulfilled. This is self-determined and is the only thing that matters. The reason why it's problematic from their side is that it self-partnership or the constant promotion and heavy promotion of this feeds into the exclusivity of Western feminism. It tells you that to be your most best the best women that you can possibly be, to be the best feminism, is to have ultra and hyper independence. This means you don't need to live your life or, or you live your life absent and not, not dependent at all on the idea of having a man in your life in the first place. The problem with this is that you force women to chat. We need to challenge the entirety of the patriarchy rather than forcing forcing women into a bubble where they have to isolate themselves. They feel the constant need to be alone or to be the most independent individual in order to be a feminist in the first place. We think that if you want to be a housewife or if you want to opt into certain traditional patriarchal structures, that your choice and the ability for you to choose is what matters. Because the reason why all of these choices are illegitimate in the first place currently is because these aren't choices made for you. These are choices forced on you. Society tells you to stay at home. Society tells you to do this. And therefore, that is why it's illegitimate. Similarly, and this is a direct parallel to why the side of proposition is illegitimate in promoting these ideals. Because telling women that you can't feel happy by yourself delegitimizes the ability for them to want to opt into relationships because of my interactions that happen within the movement and individuals constantly question their ability and their self-worth if they're unable to feel fulfilled with themselves in the very first place but number two you never give them a choice because they should always have the choice to opt into either it's not about whether which system is better whether being in a relationship is more fruitful whether being single is more fruitful the point is no individual should ever tell a woman what to do and that is the only side and the only side that does that is side of opposition where you don't have the reverse narrative of telling people to be single All right, thank you, Speaker, for speech. <clears throat> and now I'll reverse the order and invite back up the leader of the Gen team to conclude this team's case. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah, throughout this debate, there's been a very unclear definition as to which side provides choice feminism and in which side allows women to be able to uh, truly freely choose what, what, what they want, whether it's to be single or whether they want to opt into a relationship to be fulfilled. That's what I'll do today, right? I'll tell you why we proved one very simple thing, why we proved our burden and why you have this, is, this debate, right? I think the first issue is like which side prov provides choice feminism to women. I think it's very important clarification that government has to understand. Because it's a very simple idea, right? Heavily promoting self-partnership means you also heavily promote against being in a relationship. And the reason as to why this is true is because they are literally opposites. If feminism says that self-partnership is good, it means you. It, feminism also says that you shouldn't opt into a relationship. That's what government does. They heavily promote self-partnership and they heavily promote against being in a relationship. What, what then did we say? We told you our simple counterfactual about giving women a choice, right? We told you that the point in which you don't promote any particular thing means you allow women to freely choose whether they want to be happy as a single person or whether they want to opt into a relationship to be fulfilled. Because government has run away from the simple burden of, defend, of defending their burden, they lose this debate, right? But what other thing did Gav say? about it right firstly they said about how you there's less pressure on women to be in a relationship in their world often this is a contradiction right because the first thing that they told us is that there's an immense amount of societal pressure to uh, for a woman 
to be to be in a relationship like they said that they would cause all sorts of mental trauma and all sorts of feelings of insecurity and no confidence in yourself yet they also tell us that the point which uh that they also tell us that suddenly in their world women will be happy the point in which they are uh, they are single and the point in which they can further their career without having a family they they never accounted for this huge amount of societal pressure that they said existed in their world what is another thing that they told us they said there was less abusive relationships but we already proved to you that there will be abusive relationships in both worlds but abusive relationships in the side of government is going to be so much more pernicious and the reason as to why this is true is because oftentimes there's less support structures for women in relationships because the idea and the slogan of feminism is to be single and to not opt into a relationship and this is this is harmful right because there's no support structures for women in unhappy relationships and the third thing oftentimes and this is what we also told you is the point in which you say you say it's the burden of women to run away from relationships or not be in a relationship it shifts the burden from men to women to change right it tells uh, the feminism is now telling women that you that in order to be happy, don't be in a relationship. And we tell you this is the point in which uh, there's no there's no choice feminism and a government that never proved this, right? Chair, it's not our burden to prove how we further the feminist movement. What we did prove to you is how government's policy worsens and destroys the feminist movement. How did we do this? The first thing we told you is that we fra is they fractionalize the feminist movement when you alienate women who actually do want to be in a relationship, whether A, you coerce them into making a, into being single, or B, the point in which you, like, there's no support structures for men who actually want to be in a relationship. And the second thing we proved to you, and this was also unresponded to, the point in which you appear as an anti- men movement because of the fact that you actively reject the help of men and say you don't need the presence of men in your life the point in which you appear to be an anti-man movement is when you lose a lot of allyship right and the third thing we told you is how you shift the burden of men to change now you shift it to women right for all those reasons now we're proud of to oppose i thank the speaker for a speech I'll light up the uh, leader of the affirming team to conclude the team's case and this debate. All right. Narrative, which is what proposition has told you throughout the entire bench, that the narrative and the status quo is so strong that the only way to neutralize it is by having our side and by actually strongly promoting and like heavily promoting these uh, self partnership and self fulfillment. We think this is the narrative that we've been standing by on our side. We don't think opposition has really sufficiently engaged with it throughout the bench. Two voting issues I'm going to tell you in this debate, how you are going both. First issue on individual liberty, and second issue on whichever fulfills the goals of, the, of feminism. First thing is on individual liberty. What we get from opposition is like, if we tell you a few things, right? I think the first thing they tell you is that these women get like individual liberty because they're allowed to choose like uh, whether they want to be in a relationship or not, or whether or not they want to like uh, be single, right? We already told you down the bench that the narrative and the status quo is so strong that even if you have a sort of choice of feminism, it's not really possible to neutralize. I think it's so strong to the point where people keep telling you to be in relationships and the narrative is really ingrained in society, right? I think it ties into the second clash, wherein we already told you from first prop that uh, we already told you from first prop that like as like a marriage and relationship, it's such a big like a uh, patriarchal structure that in order to actually remove it or actually uh actually able to like sort of neutralize it somewhat, we actually have to heavily promote the opposite. That is to say, right? When you actively promote choice feminism, it simply isn't compatible with the status quo in general. Because even if you have like counterfactual, uh while like while you have this counterfactual, when the, it remains that people still want you to become relationships, when this patriarchal structure so like this, you're not able to have any sort of tangible effect. We're not sure that we got any response to that. The second thing to tell you, right, is that like uh, on our side, we're going to like demonize people who have relationships and we're going to alienate them from the rest of the society. I think the 
two and top three, Poetry Chat is already not very exclusive, right? I think in order to get a message across, what we need is not just good, not just to like demonize the like opposing force, like not to demonize relationships and not to demonize this, right? We don't always need it. That's the heavy like promotion. Because you're explicitly said and I've said other throughout the bench, I'm not going to say relationships are bad and that you're not supposed to be in relationships. I think we emphasize the importance of like knowing yourself and actually fulfilling yourself and having this sort of relationship. I think there's basically the point that there wasn't really an engagement. And what we said, like, oh, the setup, we did, we win this clash as well. I don't know if you the goals of the feminist movement. But it's not one of the top two running a unique material. If we told you that these social movements have to develop, right? Because when we already told you that these, these feminism movements is not only uh, like about like uh, equal rights, but are now actually shifting it to like dismissing patriarchal structures and making sure these patriarchal structures are undermined, this is where we actually have to do the opposite of what these patriarchal structures say. I think what we get from our opposition is two things. The first thing they tell you is that, look, right, they're going to become anti-men and uh, everything, everyone's just going to suddenly hate men, like, like say they don't have any role in society. We were the thought that Paul three explicitly told you that me, uh, even though you're like valuing being single, doesn't mean that you're suddenly hating men, right? I think it remains to say that men still have a role in society. We're not saying that we're going to hate men and suddenly like demonize them, and we're going to hate every single man that exists, right? I'm sure at best this is a stretch. At worst, we're not sure that this is like even true at all. Tell you it's like party fragmentation, and people are going to be so alienated by the narrative that they're going to fragment. Told you in which in order to actually neutralize the narrative you actually have to sort of like uh have, have to do the opposite i think when they tell you the mechanism they give and what they actually find them it's because look right you demonize people in relationships that is why you fragment we already told you down the bench right in which the mechanism we do so it's not actually saying relationships are bad we're not actually condemning the people who are in relationships rather we you push this narrative that like uh fulfilling yourself is much better in the sense that we actually outline the uh, goal of the feminism movement, that's also you take down the structure. And, and in our side, we're actually more effective to do that. We think we're actually like, better uh, on this clash in general. For all of the above, I'm so proud to propose. I well, thank the speaker for speech and thank both teams for the debate. Uh, so at the start, um, and like I said, given that it's a silent round, uh, we'll be giving a oral adjudication. Uh, so um, yeah. Uh, feel free to return back to the main room. Um, good luck, good luck to both teams for the break. Um,